The wide prairies of the northwestern United States, surrounded on all sides by mountain ranges, stretch the expanses of the Columbia River Basin. Like Tolkien's Shire, home of the hobbits, this region is the perfect model of serenity and peaceful, hard worked into the landscape. Like a giant shell, the ranges of the Cascades and the Rocky Mountains contain a quiet and rolling pearl, the Palouse region. Traditionally, the Palouse region is made up of fertile hills and prairies that stretch along the river of the same name. To the south, this area is split by the Snake River from Walla Walla County and the Clearwater River from the Camas Prairies. Stretching north along the Washington-Idaho border, the region experienced a boom in settlement and wheat cultivation in the 1980s, becoming an important chapter in the history of the rise of southeastern Washington grain farming. Although the geographic definition exactly describes the Palouse boundaries and remains the most common today, the term is used more broadly to refer to the entire surrounding wheat growing region. Thus, the World Wildlife Fund includes the Camas Prairie in Idaho and the Walla Walla District, as well as the Big Bend region in the central part of the Columbia Plateau. The bizarre and picturesque hills that indicate the Palouse Prairies cover more than 19,000 square miles of the Columbia Plateau in southeastern Washington, western Idaho, and northeastern Oregon. Expanses covered with vegetation are crossed by deeply cut, sometimes to the rocky base, canyons of rivers. The gently sloping hills that roll on the horizon in waves are vaguely reminiscent of sand dunes. However, the Palouse Hills have nothing in common with the desert dunes. In the thickness of the land covered with lush fields, a history stretched for millions of years is hidden. With eternal similarity, the light brown soil which forms this sloping landscape does not contain signs of the movement of soil masses characteristic of desert soils. Instead, the hills are composed of alternating layers of loess and calcrete, as you would expect in the temperate arid region that constitutes southeastern Washington state. The alternation of soil layers is clearly visible on the slopes of river canyons. The structure of these strata demonstrates that the loess of the Palouse Hills was accumulated as a result of silt falling out of the atmosphere. In addition, the ubiquitous traces of plants and insects in the thickness of the loess confirm the conclusion made on the basis of laboratory research. Its individual layers accumulated over a long period of time on a basalt base that formed millions of years ago. The thickness of the Pelusian loess is heterogeneous. In the very place of the most massive sediments, the loess layer reaches 246 feet. The degree of development of individual layers of calcrete, together with laboratory dating of the soil, indicates that each layer of calcrete represents a period of thousands to tens of thousands of years of weathering and soil development that occurred between episodic periods of low deposition. According to geologists, the oldest layers of soil accumulated here more than a million years ago and the uppermost layer began to form from the end of the last ice age and continues to this day. The origin of the name of the region Palaz is not completely clear. According to one of the more probable theories, French Canadian fur traders adapted the name of one of the local Palaud tribes into the more familiar French Palouse, which means lawn and which so successfully matched with the spacious and fertile landscapes of these parts. Be that as it may, it is reliably known that local lands were settled long before the Europeans' arrival. The first traces of permanent humans living in this territory are more than 12,000 years old. Fertile lands contributed to a sedentary, nomadic way of life. According to archaeological sources, the first earth ovens were built on the Palouse lands more than 8,000 years ago. Most of the indigenous population were the so-called Indians of the Plateau, 
a large group of peoples who differ both in language and way of life from the inhabitants of the rest of the continent. The main specific features of the local Indians, noted by both early and later expeditions, were their extreme peacefulness and dependence on the harvest of edible roots. In addition, stocks of salmon and root crops collected during the summer allowed the natives to arrange permanent winter camps, not worrying about food throughout the entire cold period. The Palouse's remoteness from the centers of European colonization allowed the local tribes to keep an original culture for quite a long time. However, the settlement of the continent by immigrants from the Old World, albeit indirectly, influenced the history and traditions of these tribes. Thus, it has been established that the smallpox epidemic that broke out through the fault of Europeans on the continent in the middle of the 18th century significantly reduced the number of the indigenous population. Also, horses brought to America had a significant impact on the culture of the Indians. Without directly encountering Europeans, the Nez Perce Indians who lived on the Palouse Prairie managed to not only master horseback riding, but also to breed a unique breed of horses. This spotted breed, most adapted for long distance travel over rough terrain, gave the name to the whole variety of breeds subsequently bred in the United States and having a characteristic heterogeneous color. In honor of the region where the Nez Perce people selected horses, all spotted American breeds are called Appaloosa, which literally translates as from the Palouse. Until the end of the 18th century, contacts with white people were extremely few. However, at the turn of the century, the development of navigation and the peacefulness of the natives drew the attention of capitalists to the fertile expanses of the northwest of the United States. Initially, the Palouse was developed by livestock breeders. The local landscape was ideal for raising goats and sheep. The aridity of the region, according to the then agronomists, made the soil unsuitable for agriculture. However, after several decades, local farmers noticed that the natural conditions are ideal for growing wheat, which is sensitive to both lack and excess moisture in the soil. George Simpson, the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, was the first to draw attention to the potential of the land in the Columbia Basin to produce a rich harvest. While on an expedition to the West Coast in 1825, he gave the following assessment of the agricultural potential of the Palouse and the surrounding territories. On this land, you can grow grain in any quantity, all the more annoying that attempts to cultivate it have never been made. In an effort to master the Western expanses, the United States government created conditions that promoted several waves of immigrants. The influx of new arrivals from the east of the country led to conflict with the indigenous population of Palauza. At the end of a three-year war with the participation of regular troops, in the year 1858, the original tribes were forced to move to the reservations assigned to them. The first colonies leading agriculture on an industrial scale began to appear in the district after the start of mining developments on the west coast of the United States. A great influx of labor demanded large amounts of food. Because of the misconception of mild winters, most ranchers favored free-range grazing, a practice common in the southern states. Nevertheless, a series of harsh winters, completely unexpected and disastrous for livestock breeders, forced farmers to change their occupation. Pastures were turned into arable land at an astonishing rate. Official statistics reflect well the events of those years. If in 1896 Washington farmers produced 6 million bushels of wheat, then in 1905 almost five times as much, 25 million bushels, almost all of which were collected in the Palouse. However, the wheat boom was not a smooth process. It took two decades of experimentation before Palouse became the wheat mecca. 
It took a long time to find suitable varieties of wheat. The seeds that the first farmers tried to cultivate were intolerant of the dry winds of the Colombian prairies. Part of the problem was solved by a three-year crop rotation cycle. After two years of harvesting, plowing was left fallow for one year. At the same time, unpredictably wet years led to the death of already harvested crops. Another misfortune was the local fauna. In some places, the fields were so overcome by hordes of gophers. According to the memoirs of the pioneers, when the crop reached two or three inches in height, hundreds of these rodents pounced on the shoots until they completely destroyed the entire field. Other areas were overrun by hares. Farmers did everything they could to save their crops. So in some schools, in particular in Spokane County, they held competitions for the largest number of rodents that elementary school students managed to poison. The railroad, which was built in the second half of the 19th century, linking the west and east of the country, radically influenced the pace and nature of farming development throughout Washington. As the mines were depleted, the need for food by the local population decreased, and the Palouse grain growers focused on the export of grain. This was facilitated by the port's development on the west coast. Growing industrial wheat in those early days was work-intensive and costly. First, it required a large number of workers who needed to be supported. In addition to human hands, the farm required numerous horsepower. Significant investments were also needed to purchase specialized harvesting equipment. The most important machines, the use of which greatly facilitated the work of the grain grower, were the harvester and the threshing machine. The reaper was a giant drum reaper, but instead of a lawn, it cut ears of mature wheat stalks. For the operation of one such unit, at least six horses were required, which pushed the car in front of them. The reaper, as a prototype of a modern combine, had a conveyor belt that delivered ears to a van running parallel. The wagons shuttled between the reapers and the threshing machine, the second key mechanism. Initially, 12 to 14 horses were required for mechanical threshing of grain. However, by the end of the 1880s, steam drives began to replace them. Although automation reduced the number of horses, the process still required at least 20 workers per farm. Since the work was only in the warm season, farmers willingly used visitors for seasonal work. Beginning in July, Dozens of people came by train to the wheat towns in search of work. The main streets of the towns were flooded with hard workers from all over the North American continent. Some followed the harvest season, moving from south to north, from Texas through the Dakotas and all the way to Canada. Some abandoned less profitable farms in other parts of the world to raise money to pay off debt. There were also many who left their homes forever in search of a better life. Thousands of sacks of grain passed through the hands of these people. They drove cars and horses, overwhelmingly uninterrupted and dirty work having no other way out. People put up with conditions that seem unthinkable to modern man. In addition to the severity, harvesting was also a dangerous craft. Threshing machines demanding safety conditions often became sources of ignition and detonation of the dust-air mixture. So, in the hot summer of 1914, no less than 40 spontaneous explosions in threshing shops were recorded on the Palouse territory. After a series of explosions were repeated the following year, a study was carried out that increased safety requirements and reduced the frequency of detonations during grain harvesting. By early 20th century, industrialization had reached as far afield as the state of Washington. Combine harvesters replaced the inefficient harvesters in the fields of the Palouse. Having begun 15 years earlier, the expansion of these outlandish machines was almost completed by 1905, and decades later, they completely ousted competitors from farm barns. 
Despite the bulkiness, absurdity, and high cost of the first machines, the advantages of combines were obvious. Instead of three or four separate territorial and time processes, there was only one. Within the framework of one unit, the grain was cut, threshed, and even packed in bags. Also, the advantage of combining was the width of the process strip. Some of the largest harvesters cut swaths of 33 feet wide, which made them remarkably efficient. But it also meant that they required huge numbers of horses. In most cases, a team of 32 horses or mules were used, but up to 50 animals were sometimes required to pull through the hilly lands. Another disadvantage of using combines in the uneven expanses of the Palouse was the threat of tipping over. This required additional modernization of the unit from local engineers, so most of the combines that worked in the fields in the Columbia Basin were improved with side equalizers. Local farmers liked these clumsy machines so much that even after the appearance of combines with internal combustion engines, they remained in service for a long time. It was not until the late 1930s that mechanization took over. With the improvement of agricultural technology, the cost of harvesting had decreased significantly. First of all, by reducing the hired force. Now, instead of a brigade, the farm needed no more than three or four workers. However, according to contemporaries, the spirit of the holiday that accompanied the seasonal influx of labor migrants disappeared without a trace. Where farmers used to be at the center of a hectic life, now they were lonely separated by hundreds of acres from each other, whose days passed in the noisy cabs of combines and other agricultural equipment. In any case, it was hard to overestimate the impact of mechanization. During the period of active use and improvement of harvesting machines, the harvest of Palouse farmers tripled from 50 million bushels in 1936 to more than 150 million in 85. However, mechanization was not the only or even the main cause of such enormous increases in productivity. Three other factors were even more important. Advances in research and fertilizer availability, collaboration between farmers and scientists to reduce soil erosion and control crop diseases, and new strains of wheat obtained through genetic manipulation. In 1990, wheat was the region's fourth most important agricultural product after apples, milk, and cattle. The top five wheat producing counties were Whitman, Lincoln, Adams, Walla Walla, and Grant. Remarkably, scientific advances have ensured that about 87% of the wheat crop is harvested from dry lands and only 13% ripens on irrigated lands. In the 90s of the last century, a large-scale amalgamation of agricultural enterprises began. With a constant crop area, in 20 years, the number of farms has decreased by 57%. One of the few things that have not been affected by the development of technology throughout the past century is the markets for agricultural products grown in the Palouse. Like a hundred years ago, the Middle East and Asian countries are the main consumers of grain from the northeastern prairies. From the bakeries of Egypt to the Japanese udon noodle factories, everywhere they use flour ground from grains grown in the open spaces of the Columbia Basin. The need for seasonal workers also remained unchanged. To this day, despite the development of industry, hundreds of people come to the region to work in the fields during the harvest season. Most of this workforce is made up of migrants from abroad. According to one of the representatives of the Association of Farmers Palouse, difficult working conditions, low wages, and a relatively short period of employment repel local residents. Wheat cultivation in Washington has come a long way from dusty, sweat-soaked reapers and threshers. However, in many respects, it hasn't changed much. It's still not an easy way to make a living. However, there is great satisfaction with every harvest, knowing that it's providing vital food to millions of people 
around the world. Be that as it may, the low population density, the absence of heavy industry, and the Palouse landscape shaped by nature and man create an idyllic picture. Hilly fields flooded with greenery, deep canyons of rivers, laconic and sensual rural life attract the eye and set you in a peaceful mood. For a resident of the metropolis constrained by the modern pace, traveling through such pastoral expanses has a life-giving effect. That is why at the beginning of the 2000s, a program was introduced to develop tourism in the region. The culture of the United States tied to private vehicles dictates its own rules in the organization of tourist routes and infrastructure. In the case of the plains of the Colombian watershed, this situation played into the hands. The main attraction of the region is not so many individual locations as the road that stretches between them. This is how one of the most picturesque tourist routes of the North American continent, Palouse Scenic Byway, appeared. The route is a system of 61 regional highways, most of them extensions of Indian trails, wagon settlers, and the region's first railroads. Thanks to this, visitors can experience not only the aesthetic satisfaction of natural splendor, but can also feel the spirit of the development of the Wild West. The seven main routes of the Palouse Scenic Byway run in two main directions and traverse 16 incorporated communities. Leading from south to north, the road begins in the area of Lewiston and Clarkston cities, named after the leaders of the Discovery Corps expedition. At the beginning of the 19th century, this mapping campaign crossed the continent and laid out a route that is still valid today to the northwestern United States. Here in the south of Whitman County, there are centers for collecting grain and the largest river grain terminal in the region. The first community that the route crosses is Uniontown. Despite its modest size, the town is famous for its vibrant social life. It hosts an annual sausage eating festival, Whitman's largest antique sale, and the oldest winery in the region. The wines served here are created using grapes from local vineyards. Driving a little more than a mile north, travelers enter the territory of Colton. There are two schools for less than 400 inhabitants which glorified Colton as a city with great prospects in the field of education. In fact, children from all nearby farms travel to this city to study. With its picturesque scenery and authentic farms, Colton has become a popular destination for country-style weddings. Therefore, the largest photography studio in the area is located here. And summer is a real hot time for all local residents involved in the wedding business. The main source of income for the people of Colton is newlyweds from Pullman, the next town on their way north. It's the largest population center in Whitman County. It's named after the engineer and inventor of the sleeper car, George Pullman. It was expected that the industrialists would lay the main railroad line through the town. However, this did not keep pace with the plans of the magnet, and the rails were laid through the city of Spokane, located a few hundred kilometers to the north. Pullman's main attraction is Washington State University, founded in 1890. It has been the alma mater for a huge number of researchers in the field of biology and agriculture and the oldest state university in the western United States. Such educational institutions arose in the states in connection with the need for the speedy development of the wild expanses of western lands. Despite skepticism from the scientific world, derisively called how universities have developed into full-fledged outposts of science, many of which, including Washington State University, have gone far beyond the realm of agriculture and animal husbandry. Currently, Washington State University has six branches in different parts of the state, and the total number of students is about 30,000, which exceeds the number of residents in Pullman. 
Heading west out of Pullman, you can get to the territory of the abandoned town of Almoda, a historic Nez Perce indigenous site. Almoda has become one of the largest regional grain shipping points on the Snake River. However, the construction of the Little Goose Dam downstream of the Snake resulted in the complete flooding of the village in the latter half of the 1960s. The grain terminal exists here today, however, tourists come here for the hiking trail along the river. For several miles, this trail offers some of the best scenery in the entire American Northwest. Not far south of Elmoda is Wawawe County Park. This is a great place to camp and swim in the cool waters of the Snake River. Many tourists use it as an overnight stay on their way to Kamiak Butte. This is a remnant mountain that rises above the hilly agricultural land of the Palouse to a height of 1,109 meters. Amid an ocean of wheat fields, Kamiak Butte is a unique wooded island. From under the shadow of the grove that covers the remnant, tourists can enjoy the landscape of the Columbia Valley stretching to the horizon. After the extinct Almoda, the next stop on the traveler's path, Colfax seems like a real metropolis. And this is not surprising. According to the census achieved in the 13th year of the last century, this city was the most densely populated in the district. Colfax was the top contender to open Washington State University, losing narrowly to Pullman. Over a century and a half of history, Colfax has acquired its own legends and artifacts available to an inquisitive tourist. Here you can visit the well-preserved monuments of Victorian architecture, walk along the picturesque three-mile trail along one of the tributaries of the Palouse River, and warm up while playing on the local golf course. To the west of the main road, civilization seems to be leaving the local area. Semi-abandoned farming villages stand in stark contrast to towns like Pullman or Colfax. But if you let yourself be fooled, you might be missing out on some of the most compelling locations on your itinerary. Channeled Scablands and Palouse Falls State Park. Scabland is a unique imprint of the geological catastrophes of the past. Formed by superscale floods, frozen waves of basalt rock create a mesmerizing, if lifeless, landscape. These regularly spaced, relatively uniform hills resemble the sandy ripples formed by the flow of a river. This similarity is not accidental. As in river sand, Scablin's peculiar hills are formed by the flow of water. However, unlike river sediments, the height of which do not exceed a few centimeters, the ripples of the channeled scabble lands occurred when, at the end of one of the ice ages, the ice dams that held the waters of giant glacial lakes broke. Thus, when the Cordilleran ice sheet melted, it released the waters of Glacial Lake Missoula between 18 and 13,000 years ago. There are not many formations around the world, but among them, Channeled Scablin stands out for its unique rectangular topography. A little south of Scablin, the Palouse River flows through a narrow rapid and falls 200 feet into a seething basalt bowl. From there, the current moves rapidly through a winding gorge of basalt to its southern end at the mighty Snake River. Carved 13,000 years ago, the Palouse Waterfall is one of many active waterfalls in the path of many Ice Age floods. The Palouse Waterfall is incredibly picturesque, and many artists or photographers come to see it firsthand. The park organized here offers three different locations overlooking the waterfall. The lowest point allows you to get to the waterfall by stairs directly from the parking lot. The path to the second site is equipped with information boards that tell the story of a secluded canyon. The third and highest overlook offers a panoramic view of the falls and canyon of the Palouse River. Due to the geological structure, mobile communications are not working in the park, which allows you to dive even deeper into the times when this natural wonder was formed. Further north and where the road crosses the Palouse River, there is a town of the same name. 
the peculiar and logical heart of the entire region, the city of Palouse is a vivid example of the architecture of the period of development of the West. Founded in 1875 for the needs of an agricultural company, it has not changed much. The town welcomes tourists well. Its eateries and restaurants are famous for their attention to all the needs of the modern tourist, serving both meat and vegetarian dishes in abundance. The Shady Park on the riverbank is a favorite place for recreation for both locals and guests. Despite its small size, the cultural life in the town is in full swing. The schedule of exhibitions, cultural and entertainment happenings, and gatherings of interest clubs are scheduled year-round. For lovers of outdoor activities, rafting and kayaking are organized on the river. However, when planning a trip there, you should check the calendar. From Sunday to Tuesday, many establishments are not open, and their owners most likely are busy at home. The next town along the route is called Garfield. The road leads to one of the most beautiful places in the area. High above the Palouse Hill rises the quartzite bluff of Steptoe Butte. The geological anomaly is listed as a protected site in Washington State. It's one of the oldest rocks in the Pacific Northwest and marks the boundary of the original North American continent. The rock that forms the hill is over 400 million years old while the basalts that underlie the rest of the Palouse were formed between 7 and 15 million years ago. Named after Colonel Edward Steptoe, the mountain has become an archetype. All geological formations of this kind bear the name of this lonely hill. The location of the mountain is ideal for astronomical observations because of this, at the beginning of the last century, a hotel with an observatory was built on the top of Steptoe. However, the remoteness of big cities led to the imminent closure of the institution. Steptoe is now a magnet for tourists and photographers who find the former hotel's observation deck the perfect place to take panoramic photos of the Palouse. Steptoe State Park owes its existence to local activist Virgil McCroskey. He devoted most of his long life to the protection of nature until his death at age 94, working on the organization of reserves in Washington and neighboring Idaho. His home, which now houses a museum, is in the town of Oxdale, the next stop along Palouse Road. It's one of the oldest communes in the state, some local buildings are listed on the National Historic Register. The name of the locality refers to Thomas Oaks, a former vice president of Northern Pacific Railroad. Neighboring Oaks, the town of Teco, with a population of less than a thousand, provides an extensive range of entertainment for guests. Along with a museum of antiquity and an antique shop, the town has a picturesque golf course and a public swimming pool. Fans of extreme sports can appreciate the landscape from a height during a parachute jump. Photographers love Teco for its beautiful view of the historic Milwaukee Road Railroad Overpass. Also in the town is the cinema Imperial, built in the style of Art Deco in the 40s and completely restored at the expense of the townspeople. Teco is located at the foot of the mountain of the same name, the view from which is also one of the attractions. Just west of these two towns in the village of Rosalia, a memorial was placed in honor of one of the most dramatic moments of the American Indian War. Here, under the command of Colonel Steptoe, the American army of 160 soldiers was defeated. The battle is notable in that soldiers held high ground against vastly superior Native American forces for several days without provisions or ammunition. The colonel himself, with remnants of the army, managed to get out of the encirclement under the cover of night. Steptoe Battlefield Park is a U.S. historic heritage site. The villages of Fairfield and Rockford complete the journey from south to north. Fairfield is famous for its steam farming museum and its majestic U.S. national flag celebration. 
In addition, the local Museum of Antiquities has preserved a bank vault from the time of development of the Wild West. There are three noteworthy museums on the territory of nearby Rockford, the Northwest Exploration Museum, which contains artifacts from the late 19th century, the Military Museum, containing artifacts donated by residents who took part in the World Wars, and the Farming Museum. Founded in the late 70s of the 19th century, this city became the center of trade in the region. After the railroad was built through the village in 1889, its population reached a record thousand people for that time. However, after the introduction of the achievements of mechanization, the number of people inhabiting Rockford began to decline rapidly. During the relative improvement in the demographic situation due to the influx of migrants in recent years, the population today is less than half of the original. However, despite the expected desolation, residents in love with their land were able to fill the sparsely populated farming town with warmth and comfort, not forgetting to spice it up with attractions for visitors. The fate of Rockford reflects the history of the entire Palouse, which in turn is an icon of the fast-paced times and the need to embrace change. Thanks to the dedication of conservationists like Virgil McCroskey and the unwavering patriotism of the Columbia Valley farmers, the region doomed to oblivion has become not just a gem, but a priceless necklace 